Praise the Lord. All right. So, today I'm going to do a little recap. But the Lord has had us in a season of teaching according to the present truth. According to the present truth. Say the present truth. The present truth. What is the present truth? The, tr the present truth is the word of God that God is speaking now. God is speaking a right now word. We have to be mindful. We have to understand. We have to be cogn cogn cognizant that God is speaking something in the now. Whenever you're looking at the scriptures, whenever you're looking at prophetic declarations, revelation, insight, wisdom, there's, God, there's something that God is speaking to you right now. I think that it's extremely important that you don't miss what God is saying to you or now. Sometimes we end up, how do we end up in trouble? Or how do we end up in adversities and strongholds and struggles? Well, sometimes it's because we're missing what God is saying in the now. The spirit of the living God is speaking even now to you. The reason why you're here is because God has been speaking to you in the now. And he has something for you now. And so the Lord has given us this direction, wisdom, revelation in this, in this area of the present truth. And let me ask you, how many people have been blessed as a result of it? Amen. How many people's lives have, have you been receiving downloads from the Holy Spirit of what to do? Yeah, yeah, because whenever you align with the present truth, God has your undivided attention and he's able to move in your life. Amen. Amen. Let's look there at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It reads what? For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. This is the apostle Peter. He's saying, this is the reason why I'm not negligent to remind you. Never be offended with a person that reminds you. There's, one, there's a such thing as a person being pestering and, and being uh, contentious and confrontational. But a good minister will always remind you of things that God has said. That is an indicator that that person is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not the only requirement, but it's an indicator. Why? Because the Holy Spirit brings all things to your remembrance. It's the assignment of the Holy Spirit to help you to remember the things that God has said and what his will is for your life. So he said, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you, are, though you know and are established in the present truth. In the present truth. Just a quick recap. We talked about in the past, in the past few weeks, we talked about living a quiet and peaceable life. Over there in um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, you don't have to turn there, but it's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. It said, I exhort you, therefore, that first of all, prayer, supplications, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, for, all, for kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Part of your a quiet and peaceable life is connected to your prayer life. Believers should have a very strong prayer life. We never run out of things to pray for. He said pray without ceasing. But our prayer life is directly connected to us living a quiet and peaceable life. How many have lived a life of chaos or lived a life where things were not in order? If you see how things can get out of order and chaotic and there's no peace, hey man, you begin to value peace. You begin to value quiet. In the place of quiet and peace is the place where God can give you vision and revelation and direction. That's why there's such a, an onslaught attack for your, for your attention. There's a war for your attention. Even right now, by the Spirit of God, there's a war for your attention. The warfare is to take your mind off the things of God, to take your, take your mind off the things that God is saying and put them on something else. What am I going to do Monday? What am I going to do this week? What's the weather going to look like? I don't know what she's going to say. I don't know what he's going to do. But when you get focused, when you have quiet and peace, you're able to focus on the things that God has for you. I submit to you that you have to be a willing participant in your own success. You have to be involved in it. It ain't just going to happen to you. Amen. You have to be a part of it. Your hands is the hands that God is going to use to do the mighty work that he's going to do in your life. 
So a quiet and peaceable life is important. How many times has the Lord said, don't say that? How many times has the Spirit of God said, don't say that? You just knew in your spirit, don't say that. Don't bring that up. Don't talk about that. I know a family that they cannot stop the ongoing spirit of arguments and chaos because somebody in that family is always going to bring up something hurtful when they come together. Remember that time that you, remember them time you ate my now laters and I gave you, I gave you the money, but you ain't have my now laters. And you just won't let it go. You have to be mindful that the Lord is saying for you to say some things and not to say some things because you don't have to repent for something that you didn't do. But a lot of people are repenting or a lot of people are coming before God broken. Father, I apologize. But the fire that they set is still burning. And this is a teachable moment. If you hurt and or offended somebody who is living and you get convicted to repent before the Lord, listen for the Holy Spirit if he is saying for you to go and make it right with that person. Because it's a lot of hard-hearted, bitter people who try to cover up their lack of sincerity in their repentance by doing it before God. And God is saying, now go make it right with them. Paul said, I have a conscience free between man and God. Hello. So we talked about a quiet and peaceable life. First Timothy chapter 2, verse, amen, 1 through 3. Then we talked about, amen, the perfecting work of God. Let's go to that. The perfecting work of God, meaning that God is perfecting the things that concern you. He is doing a perfecting work. Don't ever, as a, as a faithful believer, never make this statement, ain't nobody perfect. Because an encounter with God, time with God, learning from God is there to perfect you. It's there to make you better. How dare we put more faith on the public school system? You can say, well, if you do your school work, do your homework, if you go to school, if you pay attention, then you're going to become educated. And we know if you do, your, do, do what you're supposed to do there, you're going to learn. But when it comes to the things of God, we automatically speak words that cancel out our seed. We say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. All things are possible to them that believe. And then you go right behind it and say, well, ain't nobody perfect. Well, let's look at how Jesus deals with that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 says what? Be ye therefore perfect. Be even, what? Be ye therefore perfect. That's Jesus talking. Be perfect. How? Even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So if, my, so if I'm a child of God and my father is perfect, then why would not be? He's perfecting the things that concern you. He's perfecting the things that's concerning your attitude, your emotions, your language, your information, your wisdom. He is perfecting the things that concern you. He is starting you out on a mission, on a journey. And by the time you get to your destination, you will be perfect in the thing that he sent you to do. You get stronger and stronger, better and better. Amen? It's the will of God. It's the present truth. Many of us have assignments, things that God has called us to do, and we're not giving our undivided attention to the thing that God has called us to do. So instead of being perfected in the thing that God has called us to do, we don't learn the lesson that comes with it. Does that make sense? All right. Now, we talked about putting it away, putting things away. We said we have to put away things that are ungodly, that are childish. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 says what? For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Uh-huh. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is part shall be done away. So he said, you know in part, you prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, meaning if you stick with it, perfection is going to come and the partial shall be done away with. Verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Mm -hmm. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. My. Oh, that's good. That's saying that when I became an adult or when I became mature, it's not so much connected <clears throat> to the number. What do they say? You grown when how old are you supposed to be? How old are you supposed to be when you grown? They say. 18, I think, and 
Jewish community, they say you're 13. Somebody said 21. And I done seen a whole bunch of 18, 21, 30, 40-year-olds who are still childish and immature. So it's not reflective of the number. It's reflective to the level of maturity that you walk in. Have you put away your childlike thinking? Because God is saying in the present truth to some of you, I don't know what your age is. I don't know what your number. It's a sad thing. It's a blessed and a sad thing at the same time to see somebody young who gets it faster than a person who's old. But God is merciful because it's for everybody. He said, put away childish things. When I became a man, when I finally made my mind up to stop playing and wasting my life, he said, I put away childish things. For now, we do what? For now, we see through a glass, darkly, but mm -hmm. then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I, excuse me, even as also I am known. So he said, at one time, I really couldn't see which direction I was going. So I stumbled through life. I went through life making mistakes because I was unlearned, uneducated. But he said, now, now. In the present truth, this is the, the, these type of revelations are not time dated for a specific time and the door is open. This is after the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is giving you access, say access. access. He is giving you access to these promises, meaning that if you find out about these promises and you stand on them by faith, then you can put away the immaturity, the childishness in your life and begin to stand up and be the man or the woman that God has called you to be. Sometimes we, we used to say this back in the day, me and Evangelist James, we say, well, you, you through, but you're not through through. See, you might be, you might be through, meaning that somebody might provoke or a situation may trigger you back into that behavior. But when you through through, say through through, then no, there you go. Can't nobody pull you back into it. This is the present truth. This is the thing that brings you directly smack dab into the will of God. We have to stop playing with irrelevant revelations because we have created a zombie-like mentality in the body of Christ. This is a mentality that has people dancing, singing, and shouting for endless, fruitless things. But if you pull back a couple layers in their life, if you just look at the life of the person, it is not reflective of the influence of the Holy Spirit. The, Jesus said, you know a tree by the fruit that is bearing. And we have to stop playing church. We have to stop playing with God and start looking at the fruit that people are bearing. This is why you go into a church or you look at a YouTube video and then you see some kind of scandal in the church. How is it that the minister is robbing people of their money? How is it that the, the pastor is sleeping around and committing adultery and fornicating with the women that's in the church? How is it that they commit fornication in the church? I was, I was talking to a man of God yesterday. He said, yeah, this whole culture of fornication in the church is a big thing. I was like, what? And the thing is, they are all right with it. I was like, y'all ain't no Christians. Y'all a bunch of freaks. A bunch of biblical perverts. Because you're under the impression that you can do something against the will of God, but everybody is co-signing to the lie. See when, see, when do we get to the present truth? When do we get to the place where we stop playing with irrelevant revelations and we start moving toward the things that God is pleased with and the things that God is holding us accountable for? See, you want to enter into the apostolic, then let's deal with the present truth. The prophetic has its purpose. But you have a responsibility with the word that you hear. You are accountable to what you are hearing right now Amen. because you fighting the real devil. And the devil does not think that you wishy-washy. He, he attacked you like you really believe it. He attacked you like you able to. He attacks you based upon what you're equipped with. So he know that you have the components, you have the tools, you have the weaponry to tear down Satan's kingdom. But he don't attack you like you plan and you ain't going to do it and you half listening. He attacks you like if there's anything in them that's going to cause them to rise up and start believing, to put away childish things, I got to stop it now. How dare we play with irrelevant revelations? 
that are not bearing fruit in the lives of the people. You do a three-month assessment on any church that you go to, including this one. I put the demand here. If you've been going here for three months and you, have, and you are not growing spiritually, I am not just talking about information, and I don't mean that everything in your life got to be perfect. But if you are not growing and you don't see any type of remnants of growth in your life, you need to leave this ministry. Amen. This ain't the one for you. Amen. Because either we're not teaching right or you're not planning on doing nothing with it to begin with. Go somewhere where you can convict it. Go somewhere where your conscience is, is impacted. Go somewhere where you can't play. Yeah. If you're playing here, leave here. I promise you we don't need you. Because you're going to end up in hell playing games in the presence of God. And I don't want you to go to hell. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't deal with the things that God is dealing with in your life, in the now, then you're going to find yourself deceiving yourself. Lying is horrible. Telling a lie will end you up in hell. But the worst, it's two, <coughs> it's two worst people for you to lie to. That's God and yourself. Heck you doing lying to you for? As if you can do, you can modify what God said. Come on now. We about to go there. Did I tell y'all welcome to uh, Without Lemons Christmas? Well, welcome. In the, in the present truth, the Lord has been dealing with me about alignment. Say alignment. Alignment. What is God speaking in the now concerning alignment? Well, alignment Let's look at the definition. Read that for me, please. What is the, oh. Arrangement in a straight line. Arrangement, alignment is arrangement in a straight line. I used to live a life like this. I did five and a half years in prison. Um, I went, got all F's in school. I was all, I was something that needed to be saved for real. But my life always drew trouble. I was like a magnet for trouble because nothing about my life was in a straight line. All of my life was spontaneous to my feelings, my need. If I had a need, my need was so dominant that I would go out there and put my natural freedom on the line for a need and lose everything in the process. But anger, anger would draw me to a place to where you don't talk about my mama. You don't talk about me. No, boy, don't, you out your lead. Don't make me... Nothing in a straight line. What a straight line constitute is this. It says that if I have a purpose and I have a focus, if I have an aim or a directive, then regardless of what's on the path, I don't lose sight of what I'm going after. When you're in alignment, you're able to, be, to overcome distractions that would keep you off of your purpose. We need alignment. We need to be aligned with the will of God. God said that God said that that uh, I'm going to bless you with a family. I'm going to bless you with a job. You're going to be an entrepreneur. You're going to do all of these different things. You need alignment in your life. God is saying that I give you purpose. Over here is your destiny. Jeff, come here right here. Say it right here. Jeff is destiny. Jeff is my destiny. And I'm over here living however. And then God says, I got a destiny for you. And your destiny is right there. In the present truth, the present truth is the dialogue, the information, even the challenges that come with me making it towards my destiny. I have to be focused on the thing that God has said is mine. This is my destiny. This is the direction that God has for me. If I'm not focused in a straight line, then I end up getting distracted by something that was never intended. Matter of fact, I trade my destiny for fulfilling something that's irrelevant. Thank you, Jeff. I remember I had a dream one time. In the dream, 
I won't unpack the whole thing, but in the, a portion of the dream was this. There was a little baby walking. You know how a baby kind of has this just kind of like first steps. They kind of, not all the way, but they walk and they ever stay up. So there's a baby walking down the middle of the street. And I remember in that dream that there was, there was some pit bulls that were along the street. They were chained up. But they, you ever seen a dog or it seemed like it might get out of there? So the dogs were barking at the baby as the baby was walking. And so as, as, as the dogs were barking, I went down that road and then I saw, and then I started putting my attention on the dog. I was ready to kill the dogs. And what I realized was the baby kept on walking out ahead of me. And something was like, stop. Don't put your attention on the dog. Keep with the baby. You're stewarding the baby. So don't get distracted. I came up out of that dream. I said, Father, whatever got me distracted right now, I repent. I said, it's a waste of my time. He messed me up with that. Alignment is arrangement in a straight line or in what? Or in a correct or appropriate relative position. In a correct, excuse me, correct, meaning that it's done according to rule. You can be tracked. It's not I make up things as I go. I'm doing what I feel. I feel like doing this. I'm doing it my thing, my way. No. Correct indicates that you are doing it based on information. On. You can be traced. You can be held accountable. Because if you make up things as you go, one of the biggest lies, one of the matter of fact, one of the biggest cloaks in the body of Christ is I heard in the spirit. Yeah. You a liar. Yeah. Because everything that you're hearing ain't in the spirit, because we can't track it by the word of God. Come on. It is not consistent with anything that is in alignment with the heart of God, the will of God, the word of God. It's just you give a permission to your own error. He said a position of agreement or what? Appropriate relative positions, a position of agreement or alliance. Mm -hmm. An alliance is a union or association formed for mutual benefit. Meaning that when we get an alignment, everybody in alignment benefits. Boy, that's a good thing. That's why my relationships, that's why my, my marriage, my parenting, my friendships, the, the things that I, that I come together with, where people is concerned, that I, I put, I put a, a demand on alignment. Because when we make these alliances, it's for both of our benefit. It's designed for both of us to be blessed, not to turn on one another. We should be, we should be, we should be fighting forward and not laterally. Meaning that you shouldn't be fighting with the people that you're supposed to be working together with. Does that make sense? Amen. Look, he says a union or an association formed for mutual benefits. We're talking about the present truth. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14 says what? Oh, I'm doing it wrong. Do wait a minute. Go back there. There then. it is. Do not be unequally. Listen, y'all need to be taking notes because I promise you the enemy gonna try to steal his word out your heart. I'm binding, blocking the enemy from stealing it. But you got to be a steward of what you're receiving. This word is relevant to your life because in the present truth, God is moving you into alignment. That's why you're here. Because he is aligning you with this purpose, with this plan, with the thing that he has already set in place that's blessed. You're trying to get God to bless everything. And he said, I got a plan for you. It's already blessed. How you doing, mama? You all right? You don't fought the good fight. Your sword got blood on it, hair and teeth. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He said, don't be what? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He Do said, not don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What does that mean? Well, what it's not saying is... Don't be unequally yoked with saved people because we think sometimes because a person is saved, they are a believer. You may have believed at a time in your life and you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, but an unbeliever is a person who does not walk by faith. 
they do they have not established faith as a lifestyle. They establish faith as a means to get a certain thing. And once they get what they're looking for, they're done with faith. An unbeliever, he said, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. When we are in alignment, we have to be alignment in alignment where believing is concerned. It's a beautiful thing when brethren walk together in unity. He said, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He said, how can two walk together except they agree? You have to be able to discern whether or not the person that you're supposed to be walking with is an unbeliever. You know how you can tell if they're an unbeliever? How they handle correction. It's how you handle correction. God's will is that you do this, that you be this. But I got a purpose. I got an agenda. No, you're an unbeliever. You're actually looking for a platform. You're not looking to live for God. Because to be a believer says that if ever I'm confronted with the word of God, I don't try to make the word change. I change. Yes. I repent. He said, let your words minister grace. Your words were not ministering grace. You know what? You're right. I repent. But she made me mad. She ain't make you nothing. You just have not dealt with your, your, your potential to respond to anger. You still have not shut off the door of being spontaneous where anger is concerned. Yeah. So, when you, so when an opportunity arises for you to pass the test, you keep failing because you ain't put nothing in place. Sometimes you got to deal with it in the face of anger and keep your mouth shut. Amen. You got to go over to the, you got to go over to the scripture. It said, they that love thy law, nothing shall offend them. I keep my mind stayed on Christ Jesus. Why are you not saying that? Why are you not responding? Because my mind ain't on you. <laughs> I'm just letting you get it out, get it off your chest. Because I'm just, when you get done, I'm going to start back loving you. Go on, get it out. But at the end of the day, whenever there is, you are confronted with an opportunity to be held accountable to the word. How you respond determines whether or not you are a true believer. Notice I didn't say title, prominence, position, what you're doing in the church. Notice I didn't say the ability to quote scriptures. It's the fruit that you walk in. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. And if I happen to miss the mark and somebody say, Apostle, you, you, you shouldn't have did that. Didn't, didn't uh, uh, Pastor Mike, didn't uh, Paul do that with Peter? He said, I corrected Peter because Peter was to be blamed. Peter started acting funny. He did. He got around some people and he started acting different because some other people came around. How many of them have ever been around somebody like that? They changed up on you when somebody came around. How many of y'all was that person? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Paul, Paul held Peter accountable because Peter was to be blamed. He said, the way that you're acting, you're changing up from the gospel. You shouldn't act like this. You're trying to please and pacify these people as opposed to walking in what we have both received. Stop switching up. Look at it. He said, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not what? Do not make mismated alliances for them or come under a different Make alliances yoke. with them or Miss come Mated. under what? Or come under a different yoke with them. That, that's where the Bible talks about inordinate affections. You married, but you put more attention on your friend group. Yeah. Yeah. You 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 married, but you follow your mama and them more than you follow your husband. Come your on, pastor, please. your pastor can tell you whatever, and you follow God. But when it comes to listening to your husband, Jeez. you challenge everything that he says. Jeez. Hello, he said, do not make mismated alliances with them, or come under a different yoke. Say a different yoke, a different yoke. with them, inconsistent with your faith. What are you doing around them? You ain't leading them to Christ. Matter of fact, your ability to influence them is not greater than their ability to influence you. 
you got to recognize that you ain't that strong yet. So you need to stay away from a season. Stay away for a season. You can't handle being around that. that that's the present truth. You can't handle being around They gossip and you can't stop them. As a matter of fact, they always able to get their gossip off on you because you don't walk in a measure of anointing that causes them to be convicted when they say it around you. Is that too much? All right, let's keep going. He said, for what partnership have what? Have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness. How is it? How can we partner in any kind of way if my aim is to live right and your aim is to do what you want to do? You only do the parts of this that's relevant to the things that you think are important and you automatically disqualify yourself from the things that are there to correct you. He said, or how can light have fellowship with darkness? Galatians 4, 16 says what? We're talking about alignment in the present truth. Let's go. Have I now become your enemy because I am telling you the truth? Stop. The heck you against me for? And I'm telling you the truth. How is it that you made me an enemy? When all I've ever done is told you the truth. You know why? Because you got a problem with the truth and not me. That's why I can keep loving you. That's why I don't mind being around you. Because your beef ain't with me, it's with the truth. He said, am I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. What does it say? Have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Uh -huh. Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor. Oh, he said them false teachers, those who justify your error, are so eager to win your favor. But what? But their intentions are not good. Mm, mm, mm. They're birthing the same destruction in your house that they're experiencing. Well, Ain't no secret. Well. The fruit telling. Yep. Hello. You teach me. He said, they are trying to do what? Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me. Stop. So he said, they're trying to shut you off from me. Me and Evangelist James was talking about that. First time he came to church. Get with Apostle Devon. Or at the time, Pastor Devon. You need to get with Pastor Devon. I said, you might want to be careful doing that now. He's going to start acting like a man of God and you ain't going to like it. He said, he's trying to cut you off from me. Why? Because the level of truth, revelation and accountability will change you. And you'll begin to change into something that I can't control. Right. Right. Hello. Yes. Cause my job is to lead you, is to love you and lead you to him, yes. not to me. Yes. He said, they trying to shut you off from me. So that what? So that you will pay attention only to them. <laughs> what version is this? This is good. Are we trying to steal my scripture? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> it's the amp. The amplified version. Oh, it might be the amp. Hold on. This, this y'all seeing something. Yeah, there you go. It's one of them. I'm, I'm either in the New Living Translation, the Amp, or the King James at all times. So y'all figure it out. Come on. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. Uh -huh. If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right. That's all right. But said, let, I think it's got to be the New Living. So only the New Living talk like that. He said, if someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right. But what? But let them do it all the time. Oh, wait a minute. Not just in ministry. Let them do it all the time. This is how your spiritual mothers, mentors, confidants, counselors are deceiving you. Because they need your undivided attention to follow their revelation, their instruction, but they don't do it all the time. I'm your spiritual mother. Where your husband at? Oh, well, you know, we divorced. 
So you couldn't work out a marriage, but you got insight for my life? I'm, 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 God, has, God has sent me to be, to be over you. I need you to be under my covering. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're under my covering. I'm your covering. God sent me from the third round. <laughs> but, I, but I live in an apartment and I don't pay my bills on time. You but, but you get persecuted for righteousness. You, you just don't pay your bills, Jack. <laughs> track the life. Look at your neighbor and say, track the life. Follow the life. Track the life. Look behind the scene. Forget your revelation. What is your fruit? If, if it's coming from the Bible, it's already good. What about your life? What kind of life you live in? Let's see how you do when you get mad. Well. Hello. Well, well, forget your comprehension of the scripture. How has the scripture impacted you? He said, if someone is eager to do good things for you, it's all right. But let them do it all the time. Not just when I'm with you. Let's go back and write when you just at church. You, 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 you go from, from, from holy hallelujah in church to a whole jerk when you step out of this door. Teach the people. That's the present truth. Teach the people. Because here's the thing. Children who are raised under a hypocrite. And a, and a hypocrite can be faithful at church. A hypocrite can be in church every time the doors are open, but they do not demonstrate the impacting fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Whenever it's like that, you're always going to find some type of error behind it. You're always going to find some inconsistency there. You're always going to find where they bark is worse than they bite. Look, Proverbs 12 and 15 says what? The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. The Bible says so, 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 but, I, but I, I, saw, I saw it. I heard. I'm hearing. Yeah, that's what you're hearing. I ran to a witch. When was that? Saturday? What's today? Saturday, uh, no, Friday. I ran to a witch Friday out there walking on the trail. It's like, man, I got a witch on my trail. But I ran into a witch out there. The witch is out there. I'm walking. She said, I could just see your spirit as you was walking by. I was like, okay. <laughs> I, I could see, I could just see the spirit on you. I said, well, praise God. I said, but I say, uh, you know, and that, the metaphysical thing that says, 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 in the new age this and, I, and your chakras and your crystals and all that. I said, okay. I said, well, ma'am, I'm a apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, I cast out devils. I said, do you have, I said, do you experience the presence of God? Oh, yeah. I experienced the presence. Oh, yeah. I said, oh, you get all your information from the second realm of heaven, don't you? She's telling on herself. I said, oh, you get it all from the second. Yeah, from the second round. Oh, okay. I said, well, I said, that's the difference between me and you. I said, because you all presence and you validate yourself through presence. I'm validated because of obedience. Because plenty of people have sinned after having experienced the presence. See, anytime I get slow and quiet, you have entered into the anointing. I say, no, I'm not deceived by anything that you have experienced. Because where you operate from the second, second realm, I operate from the third realm. I said, that's why you have accuracy, but you're deceived by your accuracy. Because demons are feeding you information. And you've made an acquaintance with these spirits. So you're under the impression that you have a relationship with God because of your spiritual experiences. I said, you believe in karma, don't you? Yeah, I believe in karma. I said, 
Karma is a faulty revelation because karma is void of mercy. All of us under Christ, you cannot believe in Christ and believe in karma. Because if you believe you get what you deserve, then none of us can be saved. She's like, no, no, but I believe it. Then she want to go to the Bible. I'm like, don't use my stuff. (laughs) You was in metaphysics five minutes ago Out there on our spot In our spot, Jay It's crazy Out here, man, having to rebuke a witch On the walking trail (sighs) But Alignment, say alignment Alignment Alignment, we have to be in alignment with the word In the present truth God, there is this, there is this constant, ongoing, not never ending demand for you to get in the word, for you to get the word in your heart. It's just important because when you get the word, you get in alignment with the word. When you find out what God's will is, there's not only an informational aspect, but there's also a grace that comes upon you. The grace of it is this is that when you learn the word, God is empowering you to do the word. Whenever he reveals, whenever he gives you a desire, he shows you something in the word, that's there to help you to do the word. All right? Next one. Hebrews 10 and 6. Boy, this is good. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. He said, I don't need your sacrifices. You cannot fix it through sacrifices and offerings. Then I said, what? Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Stop. He said, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. What is that saying? That's saying that I'm picking up the scripture based upon what God is saying to me and doing it. I'm not doing what I feel. I'm not doing what I think. I'm not doing what I prefer. I'm not doing what I like. I'm doing what is written in the book of me. There is in the Bible that which is written directly of you. Your life already written about. Your marriage is already written about. Your, your, your interaction with your children is already written about. Your career is already written about. He said, I know the plans that I have for you, plans of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. It's already in there for you. All you have to do is align with what's written about you in the Bible. To do thy will, O God, and above when he said what? Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither has pleasure therein which are offered by the law. He said, I am not pleased. I have no pleasure in you operating according to the law. Hello. He said, I have no pleasure in you operating according to a law that was done away with by the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I desire is that you would get in my word and start living and moving according to my word. Does that make sense? One more point, one more scripture. Alignment with prophetic declarations. Say alignment with prophetic declarations. Say it again. Say alignment with prophetic declarations. Say it one more time. Alignment with prophetic declarations. In the present truth, when you are in an apostolic prophetic house, there are prophecies that have been made over your life. Whenever prophetic words have been spoken over your life, you have to get in alignment because God is adjusting you according to a word that's been spoken in your life. He requires that you align with what's been spoken in your life. Let's look at, look, let's look at it. This is going to help. All right, Isaiah 38 and 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. In these days, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, was what? Was sick unto death. This is a man who was sick. He was so sick he was about to die. Hello. He was in a bad situation. He was sick and about to die. And what? 
And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order. Stop. He was sick and about to die. Just like some of our situations. You may not be physically sick and about to die. But you realize that you don't have no more time to play with where your life is concerned. You have wasted enough life to stop playing anymore. Right? He said, the prophet came to him. Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said, thus saith the Lord, set your house in order. For you're going to die and not live. What does Hezekiah do with this prophetic word from this powerful prophet named Isaiah? What does he say? Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall. Hezekiah embraced the present truth. He turned his face to the wall and did what? And prayed unto the Lord. He stopped playing around with his prayer life, his walk, and the things that were right. He quit playing. Because he said, I have no more life to play with. He said, it says that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Listen to me. Because what I am telling you is relevant because there's a, there are people who capitalize on prophetic words. They make you pay for prophecies. And the sad part about it is you don't have half the sense not to go after that. People capitalize on manipulation and they are very strong, very influential. But a true prophet, say a true prophet, a true prophet. came to him and said, you about to die. It's about over for you. I don't know about you, but there are specific times in your life, whether young or old, I had this at 15 years old, where it was just dawned on me that I don't have a lot of life left. I was in a position. Now, my, 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 my situation was extreme. But it doesn't mean that it don't happen to you. Where it just dawns on you one day. Man, I don't have too much longer to play with this. I had watched opportunities pass me by. Well, I was supposed to be 16. I was like, man, when I turn 16, I want to get a car. When I turn 21, I want to go out and kick it and drink. And then when I turn this, I want to do that. And then I found myself getting older and older. And life was passing me by. How many of you have already overridden that, overridden that season in your life. You ignored it. God saying, I need you to get this right. Stop playing with your calling. Stop playing with the things that I've entrusted you with to steward. Stop playing with your attention. Stop playing with your education. It's too late. It's getting later and later and later. Finish that. Get that degree. Get in there. Get it done. Stay focused. How many? I got two credits left. Two credits left, man. Get the two credits. But I can't. But you know, I got, well, see, he, she, I say, they, it. No, he said, Hezekiah, all I know is you about to die. You know what's amazing about that? This was a word given by a prophet that did not require accuracy to get a response. <laughs> Isaiah did not have to have accuracy. He just had to get the right words to Hezekiah so Hezekiah would move. Because something about Hezekiah's way of thinking would not cause him to move unless something urgent would happen. He just had a capacity that if wasn't no trouble moving me towards it, then I won't move towards it. That's the condition of the homes. Yes. Because we ain't losing nothing right now. Yep. Because we got money. Well, we got money. We working right now. Don't you know, I've learned ever since I've been in a working adult that somewhere between November, December, January, and half of February, work slows down for everybody. So why is it that throughout these prosperous months, we don't put nothing away? Is, it, is that too practical? 
What you want? The red? You want the third realm of heaven? And then you want you want uh, glitter falling out from the sky? What you looking for? Or, or are you willing to be to enter into the present truth and be accountable for how God is moving now? God is giving you productivity. These are the most productive years of your life because you're young, and you can still stand up and see and work. But are you gonna waste it? Assuming that ain't nef- nothing is ever gonna happen. I'm always be this young. I'm always be this strong. No. Hezekiah got a awakening from prophet Isaiah. He started praying to the Lord and he said, verse three. And said, remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I've walked before thee in truth. Now, and with a perfect heart. Hezekiah is talking to God all of a sudden because he's about to lose his life. He said, I beseech you how I walk before you in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah did what? Wept sore. So God do respond to your tears sometimes when they're sincere. Crying without doing nothing, crying for manipulation's sake does not move God. How is it that God is about to take Hezekiah's life? Even though he said, I walk before you in truth with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in your sight. Wait a minute. You said this guy is living a good life. He's supposed to be. This is this is kind of like the equivalent of a holy life. Whew. This is about to plow your field sideways. Watch. He said he living right. He walking by truth. He said, and I did what is good in your sight, Father. And he cried, why you want to kill me? Why are you trying to take me out now? Then came what? Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, go and say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, Uh I have heard thy prayer and I have seen thy tears. Mm -hmm. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. Wait a minute. He said, I heard your cry and I seen your tears. When your heart is truly broken. Before God, Hezekiah said, he said, I cried out to you like a dove. And a dove makes a song. Ooh, he was crying. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He said, I cried out to you like a dove. He said, I heard your prayer and I saw your tears. God says, he said, I store up your tears in a bottle. He said, I know you was hurt. I know. I know the pain. I, start, I know. I know you try to. I know you try to put on sunglasses and cover up the tear. I know you went in the other room and cried and then hurried up and fixed yourself up. But God, why? Why does He care about your tear? Because He's a Father. You cannot connect God to tears when you can only see God as God and not Father. Because a Father sees your tears. Her father says, what are you crying about? What are you crying about, Jim? You're strong, you're a man, you're always clean and composed. But what are you actually crying about? I saw those tears. You fought them back. You fought them. You didn't want nobody to see you in that position. Hezekiah had enough sense to humble himself before God, to cry out with this righteous life. He said, because I heard your prayer and I saw your tears, I'll add to your life what? 15 years. And? And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee. Because you cried out to me. Because you prayed. He said, everything that is connected to you will receive the benefit of your cry and your prayer. He said, this whole city is on your back. He said, because you cried out to me, I had to, uh, I had to initiate something that was going to cause you to pray and cry out to me. He said, I will defend this city. This is God talking. And this shall be a sign unto thee From the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. What's going to be the sign 
that God is going to do this thing, that he's going to add me 15 years and heal this city. What is he going to do? Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which is gone from hold the sun. Hold on, hold on, reading too fast. He said, behold, I will bring again the shadow of decrees. What the heck is that? What he's saying, continue to read. Which is gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backwards. Yeah, say that, say 10 degrees backwards. Ten degrees oh, that's back. beautiful. That's beautiful. What he's saying is, before people had watches on their arm, they had a sundial. The sundial just read the sun and told you what time of day it was. What God was saying was because you repented, he said, I'll turn back time to give you another chance. He said, he said, he said, this is how you're going to know there will be a vibrancy, a reinvigoration, a new energy that you're going to have. You're going to have, you're going to have a strength to come up on you. That's going to be like right now, because the timeline is where it is because God is eternal. He controlled time. He said, because of how the time is you broken because of what you did in that time. But he said, I'm going to turn the time back so you can start over again with the right spirit. Watch. He said, so the sun returned what? So the sun returned 10 degrees. So the sun responded to God's promise to Hezekiah and the time went back. He said, by which decrees was gone down, the writing of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, when he had been what? Sick and uh -huh. was recovered of his sickness. Now, look, turning your Bible to Isaiah 38, 17. Same verse, because I asked y'all the question. If Hezekiah was doing all this righteous living, why did God send the prophet to say, I'm going to take your life? What was Hezekiah doing with this holy life, with this righteous life? 38, 17, drop down to verse 17. Hezekiah crying out, verse 9, the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered from his sickness. But what got him there? Because it's an answer, a profound mystery in the present truth. Because I'm, I'm working my, the man, I'm working my job, the woman, I'm submitting, the, the people, I'm living holy, I'm living upright, I'm walking by truth. But something got Hezekiah there. And when Hezekiah cried out before the Lord and he received a blessing, the Bible says the goodness of God will lead you to repentance. When I, Hezekiah received a blessing and God said, I'm going to add to your life 15 years, he said, I'm going to give you a sign that I'm doing this for you. The sign is I'm going to turn back the clock. Like many of you were supposed to be in trouble. You was actually supposed to not have the life that you got right now. But what God did is he said, I'm going to deliver you, free you, hear your prayer, see your tears, and I'm going to turn the time back. So when you wasted time, now I'm going to put you back at that point so you can do something efficient with the time. You. But what got him there? Behold, Isaiah 38, 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. Stop. Say it again. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. When it was supposed to be peace, I was being bitter. <laughs> oh, you can't see it. It's so subtle. Isaiah is repenting because he said in the midst of him getting blessed, he said, for peace, I had great bitterness. But you have in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. I found that I, oh. He said, I found, verse 3, I was, oh, wait a minute, the clicker. I beseech thee how I walk before you in truth with a perfect heart and have done which is good in your sight. Why are you taking me out? He said, because when it was supposed to be peace, you was walking in bitterness. He said, I realize. He didn't just say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He said, Father, what you've given me my life back, I examine myself. Then we just take a communion and say, examine yourself. Yeah, yeah. In the midst of the blessing, not being ignorant, oblivious, not being, in, not being impacted with this good thing that God has done in his life. 
He said, with all this goodness that he gave me, I repent because when it was supposed to be peace, I was bitter. Teach the people. And you ain't been nothing but good to me. This is with a holy life. The present truth, people of God. God is speaking right now. He, for some of y'all, he want to change the time. He want to turn the time back. Ain't no, not, nobody can do this but God. This is not in the hands of nobody. Isaiah was used to initiate a move of God. Isaiah was not the move of God. But Isaiah spoke to this man and said, listen, you cannot play with your life any further because your time on this earth is short. How many of you is God speaking to right now? He's saying, get that out of your life. My God. Why are you contentious when you should be at peace? My God. Why are you, war why are you over warring? Hello? Why are you over warring? Why are you fight when it should be peace? when it should be love, when it should be unity, when it should be agreement. Isaiah found his place yeah. and said, Father, I will not jack this up a second time. If that's your heart, stand to your feet. We're not going to move nothing. Keep everything where it's at. Keep the communion table, the altar, all of that. I'm going to ask you to do something. It may not be familiar to you. It may make you a little bit uncomfortable, but it's all right. Because they ain't going to hurt you. This is a time of sincerity and getting in alignment with the will of God. What we're asking God for, along with what he's revealed in his word, is to reveal to us, teach us, even correct us. I don't even mind if God takes something away. If it get me to heaven, I ain't going to hell for none of y'all. We're just not doing that. But I will say this. Your heart cried. His father Put me in alignment with the things that are pleasing to you, with the things that are in line with your will. Not what I want, but what you want. If you got to take something, take it. If you got to shake me up, shake me up. If you got to, if I need to have a rude awakening, whatever it takes, Father. But I don't want to miss out. I don't want to be the victim of robbery to be robbed of years years in my house years in my finances I was unlearned I was ignorant or the enemy just deceived me I don't know how it happened but a lot of time has been wasted and you recognize I can't afford to go through that anymore I'm just talking to your heart I'm not talking to your position I'm not talking to your title there ain't nobody to show out for here. This altar is open. I don't want anybody touching or laying hands on anybody coming up to this altar. Because I'm training you to him. So this altar call is for the sincerity of your heart. This is your opportunity to get in alignment. God is speaking. You already got enough of what to do. But this is the time. The altar is open. Come up before the altar, stand, pray. But you got to learn how to stand before God and say, Father, put me in alignment. Put me in alignment. I need your help. I need understanding. You got to start talking to God, guys. You got to start talking to him. No longer embarrassed. I've been embarrassed long enough. I've been quiet long enough. Just between you and God, this ain't got nothing to do with me. It just has to do with the will of God and the heart of God. It's for those that want it. It's for those who, that's, I'm tired of playing games. Just between you and him, just talk to him. So we got to learn how to do it somewhere. Why not now? That's it. 
I said, talk to him. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your voice. He's saying, son, daughter, my heart is relieved because now you're talking to me. People try to speak curses on your life. Oh, you're going to die pretty. You're going to die prematurely. What you did to me, sir, God, this is not going to happen. No, 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 no. No, we break every curse and every device of the enemy spoken against your life in Jesus Christ's mighty name. But this is the time. Father, put me in alignment. Father, I don't know how. You got to be honest with God. Father, I don't know how. I've never done it before in my life. I've never done it. But I need your help. Break the pattern. Break the cycle. Break me out so that I can say, do, and respond. I need fruit in my life. I don't need another lie. Help me, Father. Help me. He said he hears your prayers. He, he, he sees your tears. Don't you think for one minute that your father would ignore your tears and not hear your cry? In the name of Jesus, Father, I thank you. I thank you for these, your people. I thank you, Father, for a connection that's being made between you and your creation, you and your son, you and your daughter. I thank you, Father, that you are freeing the hearts and the minds of your people. Father, we ask, Father, for the leading and guiding. We ask for the dif discipline. We ask even for the self-control. Father, sometimes I get distracted. Sometimes I get off course. Sometimes I'm non-productive. But Father, help me to get an alignment. For you know the plans that you have for me plans of good and not of evil to give me an expected end. Align me with your purpose and your plans. Help me, Father, to work together with my family and the people that you have entrusted unto me. Deliver me from anger, bitterness, and hatred for my family members. Because, Father, you have given me this light this love, this influence. And because of you, Father, I can trust, I can hope, I can believe, I can obey you. And there's no good thing that you will withhold from them who love you and who are called according to your purpose. That's it. That's how you start. You carry it from this atmosphere everywhere that you go everywhere that you go. If you're still speaking to the Father, continue speaking. Those who are still on the altar, lift your hands up together with me. Stacy, if you will, come stand up here with me. Come on, guys. Come on, Priscilla and Kingston. Come on up here. Hurry up. Come on, Kira. Come on. Hurry up, guys. Stand over here. There you go. Good. And let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, I release the grace and the blessing, Father, that is on this word, Father, that is on your heart for your people. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name, Father, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. I ask for an open heaven that is pouring out that which is relevant. Father, that you are speaking in the now, in the present truth. Father, I pray in agreement, in alignment with my wife, with the children of God, with the future, in agreement with your perfect will for their life. Father, make them strong stewards. Give them the discipline and the patience to walk according to your will. Father, give them the, the courage to overcome distractions, even distractions of the flesh. Father, you touch them. You touch them. Your hand is what we need. Your hand is what we need. You touch them. Touch them, Father, according to your will, to the divine purpose that you have for them. Father, I declare over them in Jesus' name, 
that they shall by no means fall and they cannot miss it for they are in your hand. It's in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Father, I thank you, Father, that the impartation of your voice speaking and them speaking to you, that this dialogue, Father, would increase and grow stronger in their life if they yield to you a surrendered heart, a yielded heart. I'm not fighting you no more. I don't have no more life to live to fight against you and fight against your purpose for my life. It's in Jesus Christ's mighty name. I thank you, Father. I seal it and I bind every demonic attack against it. You cannot return. I block you and bind every demonic attack against love, against joy, against long-suffering, peace, meekness, and gentleness. I rebuke it. I bind it in Jesus Christ's mighty name and hedge the people round about with a covering to keep them. In Jesus Christ's mighty name, amen, amen, and amen. In Jesus' name, amen. If there's anybody here you have not been saved, you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said you must be born again. If you have not been born again, you need to come on up now. Give your life to Jesus. You know and God know that this is the time. This is, look, listen, we don't have any more time to play with. God has actually turned the clock back for you. And it's time for you to give your life to Jesus. Don't be afraid because you can do it. Don't be afraid because you can do it with his help. So if that's you, you haven't given your life to Jesus then you need to come on now. You say, Apostle, I'm trembling, but I'm trusting. But God want to save you. So if that's you, come on. If you want to be baptized, we can baptize you today. Don't worry about the clothes. If you want to be baptized today, we'll take care of the clothing and all of that. But we have to learn how to obey the Holy Spirit. If it's on your heart now to get baptized, Raise your hand real quick if you want to be baptized today. We ready for you. God is ready for you. But are you ready for him? If that's you, okay. With that being said, I'm going to leave a couple uh, up on the um, altar. Pastor Kiyoshi, uh, Prophetess Tanika. Miss Joan, you help me out? I'm going to leave them three on the altar. <clears throat> Here's my last altar call. Uh, well, something to say in the altar call. If there's somebody that you need to intercede for, pray on their behalf. Jesus is seated at the right-hand side of the Father making intercession for us day and night. I don't know who in your life you need to pray for, but you do. They got you. And I don't know who's praying for them, but I know that right now God is putting that person on your heart to pray for them. So if that's you, if it's somebody, the Lord is showing them to you right now by the Holy Spirit. He's showing you right now by the Holy Spirit that person that you need to pray for. It may be a co-worker. It may be a family member. It may be something that you hadn't thought about for a long time. But God is saying, I need you to pray for them now. If that's you, I'm asking you to come up. If you are a husband or a father, your family ain't been covered for a long time. And God is saying, that I need you to intercede and pray on the behalf of your of your wife, on the behalf of your children. He does not need another pastor or another minister to do something that he has called you to do. So in Jesus' name, Evangelist Jane, come on, help me pray. Janie, come help me pray. Come on. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There's somebody you need to pray for. Don't leave this place talking about some told me to pray for them. Don't let bad news catch you in disobedience. And I ain't speaking nothing bad over them. All I am saying is God is moving and he will respond to somebody who will intercede on the behalf of another. And I don't know who they are. I ain't got to know who they are. You know who they are. And God is using you 
to be the help. Believers got to act like believers. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Woman of God, Jada, come on, you're praying today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help me out. Hallelujah. Be efficient with the people. Lift them up. Pray for them. So somebody else can receive in Jesus' name. There you go. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that's saying, go up there. It's in you speaking. How many times have you said, something told me not to go up there. Something told me not to do that. Something told me to go up there. And we keep missing God. We don't have to keep missing God. We don't have to keep missing God. We can obey him. We can obey him. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Wonderful Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. One right over here. It's one right over here on my left. In Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. That whoever they're praying for, that they will be saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, that they will be baptized that they will come into the knowledge of the truth and live according to the will of God. Let their life be in alignment with the will of God in Jesus' name. Let their life be in alignment, in agreement with the will of God in Jesus Christ's mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. The one true living God. The only one that can fix it. That's what I'm talking about. I wish I was as smart as that young man when I was that age. I would come up and pray. If the Lord is showing you somebody, you need to move. If he's showing you, he's showing you because they need prayer now. Save them. Heal them. Deliver them. Set them free. In Jesus' name. Man of God, you pray it right here. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> In a minute, a a a a a a In the name of Jesus, Mama Dolores, increase extra strength. More strength is coming. More strength. More power. Greater and greater. For the Lord said, Greater works than these shall ye do. For He placed this treasure in you in this earthen vessel stronger he said I'm here to heal the broken hearted just lift up your hand all, submit to him all the brokenness in your heart because only Jesus is the best at healing the broken heart in Jesus name yeah that's it And after you have prayed, you had an, offer, an opportunity to give. Amen. If you're a first time visitor. This is the first time you've been here. Raise your hand. If you're first time here. Praise God. Y'all, we have a short reception over here next door. Amen. Just to be a blessing to you. Love on you. Um, we'll get somebody off the altar and help get y'all over there. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There you go, Mama Beverly. That's right, Mama Beverly. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. That's right, woman of God. That's right. That's right. In Jesus' name. 
Anthony, switch out with Cody. Cody, open up next door so we can greet our uh, first time visitors. Let's all stand. We're going to dismiss in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust that you learned something, that you received something good from God. In Jesus' name, for every expression of praise, worship, teaching, revelation, prophecy, and obedience in God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stretch your hands forth. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we love you. We thank you. Father, I thank you for these, your people, Father. I thank you, Father, that the blessing and increase that you have placed on their life, Father, is greater than my capacity to teach, to direct, to impart, Father. Let the increased measure of your hand, Father, be the blessing on their life, Father. Bless them. Keep them from all corruption, every attack of the enemy bring them into alignment with your perfect will father change generations in jesus christ's mighty name amen amen and amen love y'all hug two or three people before you leave y'all have a blessed rest of your day